And I'm happy to share my the time with you without having to take more time, especially from lunch. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Is anyone here for the first time this morning? Where you were not here last night? A couple people. What were you doing last night? <laughs> um, well, welcome everyone. Welcome if you here last night or coming in this morning. Thank you, Lord Father. We thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your faithful, sweet, near presence. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit, which has been given to us as a gift, which has been given to us as a friend, a person, a comforter, that represents who you are, God. We thank you. We thank you for this full representation of God here in our midst. We thank you for your triune being, your who you are, the Trinitarian God among us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you that you've called us into so much greater than what we see, what we, we, we are aware of most of the time. So we ask this morning that you will open our hearts, you will open our minds into the greater reality that we have in you, into this glorious call of the gospel of Jesus that is upon all of our lives, God. We thank you. Open our minds, open our hearts, enlarge our capacity for more of you. Enlarge our minds, enlarge the constructs of our own idea, our own thinking, our thought patterns, God, and our emotional wavelengths, God. Enlarge us in every way to, to take in more of who you are in our lives. This morning, like our sister said, let us go out, let us come in, and let us go out differently than we came in. In yeah. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 All right, that's it. We can break for lunch early. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Well, I want to share, kind of stay on the, in, in flow with what I shared last night, which is a theme of, of, the, of the conference, um, it's carrying the glory. And if you just, and, uh, just an overview from last night, if you weren't here, the, the, what was on my heart and what I shared last night was this call to the glory of God. which is such a unique call. It's not specific for one person or one individual or one community different than others. It's for all of us. It's for all of us to walk into it in that way. And the, the story, one of the, one of the oldest stories that handle and that deal with the, this manifest glory of God is when Moses redeemed Israel out of Egypt. And they began to lead a whole nation into their destiny, into their promised land. And they came to the point when God said, there is a promise. They were rebelling. They created a golden calf. And they were rebelling against God, although they saw miracles. And God said, look, I can't go any further. There is the promised land. I can't go with you because I had to consume you because of your rebellion and judgment. So the angel will go before you. You can enter the promised land. And that's when, in that context, is when Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't lead us from here. Because that is not my promised land. You are my land. <laughs> That is not what I'm after. The burning bush that, that encountered me, that's still my pursuit. You are my inheritance. You are my lot. You are my promised land. You are my inheritance. You are my past. You are my present. And you will be and you are my future. How amazing. Moses got the secret of God's heart. He got the secret in the middle of the call and the details. The, 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 the complicated part of leading a whole nation and administrating and, and governing a whole nation. He went past all of those things and found the secret of the heart of God and the presence of God, which was his glory. And that's what he was after. And he lived in such a way that he cultivated the presence of God and the glory of God in such a way that, that Joshua, his apprentice, his servant, experienced the same thing in the tent in Exodus 33, 11, where Moses met with the Lord face to face. As a man meets with his friend, and God spoke to him in that way, in a personal, intimate way. And even after that encounter, Moses left the tent and had to go and take care of a whole nation. 
But he lived in such a way that Joshua, who was in the tent with him, also got the secret in that moment. Joshua should have followed Moses out because he was his apprentice. But it says, but Joshua remained in the tent. This is a secret of God's call in our lives. Amen. No matter what he puts before you, it's always a test. It's a blessing, but it's also a test. And it's not a mean test. When you hear, oh, God's testing, not in a mean way. He's providing through the test an opportunity for us to find the secret of the heart of God. And if we miss it the first time, guess what? He's faithful. He'll present another opportunity. He'll present another opportunity. He's faithful. He is long-suffering. Before he calls us to walk, be long-suffering. He is long-suffering. He continues to bring. He continues to bring. He continues to bring. They rebelled against him. God redeemed them, brought them out of Egypt with, with incredible signs and wonders. And still they rebelled and couldn't handle the supernatural, so they created a natural idol with a golden calf. Even at that moment, instead of judging them right there and wiping them out, he says, no, you know what? There's the promised land. I still want you to inherit it. That amazing? The kindness of God. If you're a parent, that should enlarge your heart. Oh, God, how do I parent my kids? The kindness of God. The Father, the heart of God, the Father. God, I want more of that. If you're a grandparent, I want more of your heart to understand your ways. He says, no, I never will even send an angel before you. I can't go lest you come under that judgment because of rebellion. And that was another opportunity. And Moses said, no, I want your glory. I want your presence. Hallelujah. So this is our context for this morning. And there are many stories like this. Moses was not the only one who found the secret of the Lord. There are many who encountered, if you read from this lens, if you read from this perspective, if you read some of the stories or even think about, meditate on some of the stories from the lens and the perspective of finding the secret of God, you will see the story, read the story differently. David, a foreshadowing of Christ, a messianic figure of his own time, called by God at a young age, not because he was qualified, because he loved God. And he found the secret with God from a very, very young age as a, as a singer, as a songwriter, as a musician, as a lover of God. That was it. That was it. He had already, being a little a shepherd boy, insignificant shepherd boy, out in the fields tending sheep, he had already found the secret of God. When Prophet Samuel was sent to anoint this king, they sent him to his town. He came to his father Jesse's house, David's father Jesse's house, and, the, and Samuel said, hey, we're going to have a feast. Make sure your whole family's here. God's going to do something special. He's going to call one of your sons to be king of Israel. So Jesse was like, whoa, I'm going to bring all my sons. If it was me or you, you know, we would have called all of our sons. We would have called our neighbor's sons. We would have called our sibling. We would call their sons. We would have called your kids, your classmates. Hey, bring your whole class. Just in case it's not one of our boys, at least it can be from our town. The next king of Israel from our town, that would be amazing, right? If the next president of America is from this town, wouldn't it be amazing? You would have so much pride in it. That was, the, that was how the magnitude of that moment when Samuel came to Jesse's house to pick the next king. And, Sam, and, and Jesse brought all of his sons except one. We know the story, right? The first three parade before him. They look amazing. looks like, whoa. And you have to think of the, of, of the, of the process of a prophet. God spoke to him, go and I will show you. So he doesn't know yet. 
The first guy comes, and Samuel's thinking, wow, God, this guy looks tall and of good stature, looks similar to Saul. Because that's how God picked Saul. He was of great stature, stood head and shoulders, of, these are the descriptions of Saul, stood head and shoulders above the rest. He didn't have it. Saul, the first king, did not have the heart. He had the stature to be the first king. He had to bring Saul to go up to the mountain and meet with a band of prophets coming down the mountain, singing and prophesying and dancing. And he said, when you come and meet with these band of prophets, you will be turned into another man and it will, you will give you a new heart. So Saul didn't have the heart. God picked him because he had good stature, because that's what the people wanted. The people could not, remember the last time we talked about the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what we can handle, the, the golden calf, where the people, their minds can wrap around an idea, this we can handle. The intangible, we can't handle that. So it was in the same context. They were murmuring and asking God for a king and a ruler because the nations that they were going to war against, all of them had a very clearly established king. Maybe he had a banner behind him and attendants around him and the king would stand like this and that's how they would come into battle. But they would lose all the battles against Israel. Because Israel didn't have a king at that moment. They had a God who was winning every battle. But in the, in, the, in the carnal mentality, the knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't enough for them to win the battle because they had to believe God every single time. Come on. We're getting to the glory part. They couldn't handle just winning. They weren't satisfied just winning because the next time another battle came, they looked out and they saw a, a, an opposing king in his full array and banners and horsemen around him, they would feel scared again. They would look back, we don't have a king. Does that make sense? And they said, they actually asked God, give us a king like other, the other nations. So he said, okay, I can do that. He found a guy with great stature, head and shoulders, it says, above the others. He didn't have the heart, but God orchestrated the loving kindness of God orchestrated so he would come and meet with these band of prophets who came from a high place singing and prophesying and playing tambourine and on their stringed instruments and he says when you come and meet them you will be changed into another man and he got the heart fast forward now the next king of Israel you know we know what happened to Saul that was not his innate nature it was not his innate nature to be that way, and he kept getting sidetracked and being influenced by the carnal, the earthly situation. That's why when David came to play in Samuel's courts, in, in Samuel's room, what David was doing was awakening that, that, it, that early meeting up on the mountains with the stringed instruments and the, and the musicians and those who were prophesying. David awakened that same spirit in, in Saul and he got healed from mental distress. He got delivered. Fast forward, Samuel comes to Jesse's house. Bring me your sons. And the first guy comes, head and shoulders, look fit to be a king. And Samuel's thinking, God, this is it. And God says, no, that's not it. And Samuel's like, are you sure this is not it? This sure looks like Saul. No, that's not it. Shammah comes by, and, the, and Abinadab comes by. None of them, God says, no, not this one, not this one, not this one. He, all the sons walk by, God says, none of them. From a prophet's perspective, you're kind of on the chopping blocks right now. As you told them, I'm coming to select one of your sons. All his seven sons paraded before Samuel, and God kept saying, no. Who's... Who's at fault? Am I at, did I get the, my GPS set wrong? This is the wrong house? Did I not hear God? When things don't go as God spoke to you, is not the time to question if you heard God. Oh, that's really good. 
When you hear the Lord, you have to believe until, yep. not unless. Yeah. So he stood there and then he said, okay, that's not it, but you still spoke. He didn't question him. And he said, hey, do you have another, is that it? Are you sure? He says, well, I have yet another one. The word in Hebrew, and it's another one, insignificant one. That, no, it says in scriptures that I have yet the youngest one who's out tending sheep. That word is not an age description. In, he, in Hebrew, this word is hakaton, the insignificant one. Think about the levels of healing and deliverance, inner healing that this little kid would need to go through even to get into that room. His own father, at the greatest moment in the history of this little town, not only is he not invited, when asked, are there any more, his own father tells the prophet of a nation in the middle, in the midst of the entire town that has gathered to celebrate the prophet's arrival, he says, yes, I have an insignificant one. And Samuel says, bring him here. -wee. We don't get to determine the significance of the glory of the call of God on our lives. Or the significance of the, the glory of the call of God on someone else's life. Come on, that's so good. So he said, bring him here. And David comes as a little boy. He was out worshiping the Lord. He was out magnifying God here, enlarging his own capacity for God here. He had it. what Saul didn't have and had to get with the band of prophets. David didn't have the stature. Have you guys seen David play in, in, in uh, Sight and Sound? I knew he was short, but when I actually saw that, I mean, he was like, yay tall. Wow. It just makes you think, rethink the story again, you know, in contrast to one who stood head and shoulders above the rest. David walks in as a little boy, and he anoints him with a horn of oil. You see, there are hints, there are clues in scriptures. When the same prophet, prophets know a thing or two in their relationship with God. When God spoke to Samuel to anoint Saul, he knew this was temporary. He knew he was responding to the people according to where they were. He knew he was re responding to the common faith of the land at that time to give us a king like the other kings. He knew this was not the entire plan of God or the full plan of God. And so when Samuel anointed Saul, he brought a flask of oil, a breakable jar of oil and anointed Saul. But when Samuel that night anointed David, he anointed him not with a breakable flask, he anointed him with a horn of oil. Oh, Thank you, Lord. A horn is like the ram's horn. It's used for two things in, in traditional Judaic life or throughout centuries. One is a call to worship and one is a call to war. And that was a proclamation over David when they anointed him. He's called to worship and he's called to war. Thank you, Lord. So they bring David from a young age all 
that to say from a young age, he had the secret of the heart of God. He had improved himself as in leadership or in tactics and war and government or any of those things. But he had the one thing that God was looking for, God is looking for, and God will always be looking for. It is the heart after yeah. God. Come on, Holy Ghost. He had, that's the secret of God. And that will never change. Amen. God is looking all across the earth to and fro to see those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. God is not looking for a political Messiah. He's not looking for a cultural leader. He's not looking for a strategist. He's not looking for a brilliant mind. All those things are amazing and good. He's looking for those who will worship him. In spirit and in truth. Yeah. And he found one. He found one. And he anointed him to be the next king as a little boy in front of his whole town. He still walked with great challenges in front of his his siblings, the next scene, literally the next scene as you read the story, is that they were in battle against the Philistines. And guess what the role of the next king who was anointed by the prophet of the land in front of the whole town, the family, the parents, who, dad who called him insignificant, and the brothers who were not chosen. Guess what the next scene and the role of this next king was? The dad who called him insignificant said, hey, go take lunch to their, your brothers are doing something really important go take lunch to them just because the prophet anoints you in front of your whole town that does not mean your life is going to be well from then on he can change the DNA of your own call in the midst of a whole town but the whole town does not have to align and respond to what God is doing But David had a heart that walked in humility, not just before God, but before men. He should have said, why should I go and give lunch to my brothers? Did they plan ahead of time for lunch? Who is the administrator of our, bat our battalion, our army? Anyways, why should I go? I have my own responsibilities. I should be taking care of sheep. You said I was insignificant. So let me be. Or he could have said, why should I go serve lunch? Don't you know that I have been anointed the next king? You see, even in that moment, David's heart was not even his own destiny or his own call. This is important. Young people lose so many years, even many, many as adults, lose so many years so many sleepless nights thinking about your destiny. Thinking about what is my... You don't need to know your destiny. You do not need to know. You are not called to fulfill your destiny. Man, you're not going to pre invite me ever again here. <laughs> Where does it say we are called to fulfill our destiny? Show me a verse. Show me a verse to, that says we're called to fulfill those things. It says, we're called to worship the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second commandment is just like it. Love person next to you in the same way that you have found yourself in this extravagant, extravagant worship before the Lord. Come on. This is who we are. This posture will be the greatest commodity on the earth in the times to come. That we will have this place with God and we will have this unrelenting unquestioned, uncreated love for people which would be of high value in the days to come. Thank you, Lord. So David comes. His response was none of those things. 
His response was, sure, Dad. Let me take lunch. So David runs with lunch for his brothers. Fresh from the field where he continued to magnify God in his heart. He comes, and as he's approaching, he hears something that he's not used to hearing. He hears something that he's not used to because he has cultivated. Remember Moses set up a tabernacle to meet with the Lord? Not on the mountains until right here. He had set up his own tabernacle under the tree, taking care of sheep with his little instrument. He had created a tab his own tabernacle of meeting with the Lord, and he had surrounded his ears and his senses and his thoughts and his emotions and his thought patterns with the sounds of adoration, with the sounds of his own music and worship and, and songs to the Lord, magnifying God. Thank you, Lord. That's the atmosphere he is used to. That's the words that he's used to. And he brings lunch, and he as he's getting closer, he's, his feet get a little slower. He's like, wait, what? What? What, what, did, what did he say? For 40 days, this giant was taunting. 40 days. Challenging a whole army, single man, giant, challenging a whole army, and everyone was frightened, including King Saul, including the commander of their army, including all of David's brothers, all an entire army frightened of this exchange. I've been to this very valley many times in Israel. Been to that little brook where he picked up his five stones. You're not allowed to bring stones from there. I can't tell you what I did. <laughs> you can't pick up five stones. David didn't need five. Neither did I. Said <laughs> to confess, right? He comes in that atmosphere. Not only are we called not to, not to pursue the promise for the sake of the promise, is that when we face challenges, we have to live in the same way that the glory of God that is on our lives begin to manifest. This is, I'm living for the glory of God. And he came close to something that contended, challenged, and questioned the very reality of David's entire existence. David did not know anything to be more real than what he, the way he was magnifying God in his life. And when he came to this context, something challenged that sound that reality, that worship in spirit, that truth that had entered his life with his own worship and with his own prayers. He hadn't faced that before. He had faced animals that came to challenge his responsible reality. Does that make sense? The way he was stewarding. But those animals didn't have language they just had action against him, and, his, and he responded to it with strength. But here, it was not just strength. It was an accusation that came against him, what he knew to be truth. You see, worshiping God, truth is important. We have to live in the truth that we are worshiping about, of, and into we begin to embody the truth that we are singing about God. Thank you, Lord. The heavens declare. Perhaps he sang a psalm like this. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night. The knowledge of the Lord all across the earth. David! What, Dad? Come here, all right? The heavens declare the glory of God. This is his reality. 
You have to enter into the story. And he comes to this place when that reality was challenged. And for him, the truth was already manifest in his life, in his heart. He was not fighting a person or a giant or an army. He was living out the expression of the glory of God in his own life. I want you to get this in your spirit. Goliath was not challenging God. Goliath was now in this moment challenging the truth of God in David. There was about to be a showdown. Either you're true and my entire life is meaningless. Or you are about to die. You see, it's not a it's not a political thing. It's not big giant versus little boy. It's not strategy versus maneuver. It's not schemes. It's not plans. It is the voice that challenges the reality of the glory of God in your life. Either your whole life is a mistake and false, or it's going to go down. What David had resolved to do is continue to live out of the essence of the glory, the reality of the glory of God under that tree. It's going to manifest in the same way right here, right now. You uncircumcised Philistine. Come on. You come against me with a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of woo, in the name of the Lord. This is the manifestation of the glory of God in our lives. We live out of this. We live for this. We live in this. We live because of this. The glory of God is not in order to fulfill our destiny. I'm going to challenge this thing. It is our destiny. You have to get this in your heart. The glory of God, the anointing of God, the presence of God in our lives is not in order so that we can do something or fulfill the call of God or fulfill ministry or fulfill our career call. The glory of God is our career call. Yeah. It is our ministry. It is our success. It is everything. The testimony yesterday through song. You're all I want. You're all I need. Everything. Everything. It's a reality. It has to be a reality. Amen. It's not optional. It's not optional. David was not displaying his country boy skills. You come to me with spear, I'll come to you with it. Let's see. None of those things. It was, oh, he was overcome by the glory that was already had taken preeminence in his life. If you read scriptures through the lens of the glory of God in these stories, you will read them differently. Mary of Bethany. She came into a context, a room, where she should not have entered because of so many contexts. Religious context, cultural context, socioeconomic context. Context of class. Context of the shame that she was living in. But she also found the secret. She brought this expensive perfume. There's so many 
commentaries written, written about it, that it was a year's worth of wages. Other commentaries saying that was part of her dowry in that system. That when you get married, you present something to your husband and his family. That was the, showing the worth of her life. But she had found the secret in that moment that nothing she did not need to consider any more, any longer, anything for her future. This was her future right here. This was it right here. Why would I save this for something that I'm planning to fulfill my destiny? This is my destiny. And she came. In that moment, she didn't care what kind of social structure was rising against her, what kind of religious structures people, constructs, mental mentality was in the room. She pushed past all the men in the room. She came in to the utter shock of everyone. The disciples began to rebuke her. What do you think you're doing? They didn't get it, but she did. And she came and broke. It's one thing to bring something of great value like that in that context, pressing through everything, we would think, most people would think, hey, you know, I'm here, I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing. I don't need, I need, we need to use wisdom. You know, I don't be so foolish, worship the Lord, but save it. You know, you can do both. Does that sound like wisdom? Often wisdom is used, the word wisdom and the idea of wisdom is used to minimize a relentless pursuit of God. Wisdom enables the foolish pursuit of God. Wisdom encourages the even more undignified pursuit of God. She should have said, oh, I can, I can do like just a sprinkle because it's really, it's like a concentrated perfume. It will be overwhelming. I don't want to overwhelm my Lord. Far be it from me that I should overwhelm my Lord with my expensive perfume. I'll just, like, you know, one spray. You know? I'm already in trouble. I don't want to, like, have everyone running out the room because they can't handle the, the it's too strong. You know what I mean? Have you been around people that put on a little too extra perfume? I like to wear cologne. I do like one. I have my I have my one spray kind of thing. You know what I mean? There are so many natural things, but when you are consumed by the reality of the glory of God, that this is everything. This is everything. All measure goes out the window. All calculation goes out the window. Davis did not calculate, okay, now you're bigger, you're calculating our length, our trajectory. He said, okay, the sling has to be at a certain revolutions per minute, and I have to do it at this angle. He's not calculating anything. His brothers didn't come out to save him from utter foolishness. They said, this is it. I am so glad. Hey, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Samuel saying, he, go for it. This is, this is his. There's so many dimensions to these stories that we don't think about. She's not calculating anything. She's not calculating. She comes in, breaks that jar open completely. Has a perfume bottle ever broken by accident in your bathroom or your bedroom? It's not pleasant because it's overwhelming. We can't overwhelm him with our posture and our offerings, whatever it may be. There's nothing we can do to overwhelm him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So this pursuit of the glory of God does not come with identifiers of success. This 
pursuit of the glory of God, carrying the glory of God, the theme of our conference, what does it look like to carry the glory of God? Come on, it's so good. Being called insignificant one. Even after being anointed king, called to carry lunch. He wasn't called to fight the giant. That was his own glory manifesting. It was not him, oh, if I kill this giant, then I can fulfill the call of God in my life, so I better do this well. None of those things. Are you with me? You need to understand this. That battle was the glory of God manifesting in that moment. It was not him promoting. It was not an agenda. It was not him trying to be something or do something. It was the glory of God manifesting out of his life. This is what we're called to do. Hallelujah. The, call of, the cost of carrying the glory may be ridiculed. May be seeming foolish in front of your family. Maybe having contention with your children who just don't understand. We do need wisdom there, God. Thank you, Lord. Israel, Moses, back to our story. After he said, show me your glory. After this one man's encounter with the glory of God. And said, I don't want that. It's not my inheritance. You are in my inheritance. If you don't go, we don't want to go. Because this is it. You are my promise. You are my land. You are my inheritance. And he changes God's mind. And God says, okay, Moses, for you, I'll go with you. And then he says, show me your glory. And God begins to create a way for him to experience the glory and see the glory of God. You know what the cost of wanting to see the glory and carry the glory is? You would think... From that moment, in two days, they're just going to be walking into the land. And angels gone before him, before them. God said, there it is. There's the land. The cost is 40 years. The cost is 40 years. You want the glory of God? You will be tested to carry the glory of God. Until the glory of God is all that you're really after. Oh. Moses knew it. But the entire nation had to come into that reality. There's the promise. There's the angel. The pro it's given to you. But he had to bring all of them to desiring his glory above the promise which was already theirs. Do you want to carry the glory of God in your life? I will guarantee you, you may offend people. I will guarantee you, you may not make sense to many people. On any level. I'll guarantee you. That you will look foolish. You will be called to walk. A measure of faith. That is unreasonable. And that's where faith begins. Faith begins in your life. When you are, have decided. We want the glory of God to be manifest in our lives. And the activation of this kind of pursuit starts when you, for you, you can tell yourself, this does not make any sense. That's an indicator. I had a job, but I'm, I'm sharing this out of a life testimony, out of our own way of life. My father-in-law, my, my wife's parents, have been the greatest disciples for us as a family. 
And when we were married in 2002, we were, I would preach and I would tell their stories, faith stories. They were missionaries for so many years all, across, all around the world. See, it signed first in India years ago, in, in mid-70s. We're still hearing faith stories from them that we haven't heard before. So when we got married, Sarah and I, in 2002, I was preaching. I would use a lot of dad's stories. But then we made it, we had this conversation, Sarah and I, and we prayed, God, we want to live in such a way that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, which is actually right now, we would say this then. It's actually this year's 20 years. We literally said this 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we would live in such a way that we have our own faith stories with God. Amen. And we say, God, I don't have ambition. I don't have personal trajectory of this is what I want my life to amount to. We will radically follow you. Take me around the same mountain 40 times, I'll follow you. Show me my inheritance and make me walk away. I'll follow you. I'm not, I'm not just saying things. I'm talking about a testimony of my life. And it started even before I was married. I shared a little bit about it. I was working in Roslyn, Virginia. Out of college, no debt. I got an incredible job working for an investment banking company. Young, 22-year-old. Internship. Started working. I was the bottom of the rung. And there was a ladder. <laughs> Very clear one. And I was literally probably not even on the first one. The only people below me in this ladder was the mailroom people that every day brought a cart through our where we were working. We had two floors of this building right off of Keybridge overlooking the Potomac. And they were the car I, I made friends with them because we were kind of close in our <laughs> delegation. And within the first year, it, this was before the, the economic downturn and all, so nine, this is 96, 97, we would get two bonuses. And my first bonus, first bonus, not even one year, the end of the year bonus, we would get two bonuses. I didn't get the first bonus because I was just doing, I was, I was an intern, so I had the summer bonus, so the Christmas bonus came, came along. I didn't know what my, I was getting kind of like ordinary wage at that time, but it was really high for right out of college, a full pay, like a full good, full check. And I didn't know what my bonus would be. This would be like a twice a year bonus. My bonus, bottom of the rung, was $10,000. I was not even nothing in the company. I'm like, this is good. I can get used to this. Those are the years when I would rent cars all the time, every week. And I would send money to my parents in India. They're just retired. And was taking care of them and all these kinds of things. And I literally, literally did not know what to do with. I wasn't filthy rich, but in my, my little bubble, in my little context, I, I didn't know what to do with the money. I would know more now than... <laughs> <laughs> and that's when my father-in-law, was not my father-in-law yet, he said, hey, trying to come to... Remember I shared the story about going to Ethiopia. I was walking with this little kid, and that's when the Lord said to me, this is what you're called to. My heart told me, spoke to me, this is it. I found that revelation of the glory of God in my life. So I said, I'm not going to make a life decision here because it could be emotional. I'm young. I'm in, on a mission trip. Kind of like all the wrong things to kind of make a decision. You know, the emotions are high. The experience is high. So I said, I'm going to go back and work at FBR for one more year. And if what I'm feeling now is true at the end of this year, then I know that this is what I want to do. I went back and my heart just like, began to expand and break at the same time for what I felt was kind of like connected to my purpose. But I wasn't pursuing that. I said, God, you, you, me. Long story short, I had tremendous, like out of the world experiences that confirmed. I wasn't asking for confirmation till, till now. In my walk of faith with God, I have never asked God for confirmation. It's not wrong. I'm just telling you my testimony. When God speaks, I say, God, I want to, I want to hear your voice. It's like when I'm at home and I call my kids, 
Say, hey, it's you, I'm come down. I don't want him to say, how do I know it's you? <laughs> I keep it simple, you know what I mean? I'd be like, boy, I'm going to let you know that it's me if you don't already. Right? I, want, I wanted to train my ear to hear God at the risk of missing him altogether and failing, but that I would train. Even if it's by hindsight, in those early years, I decided, if you speak to me, I'll follow you. Wherever. We were singing this yesterday. Like, put me, what is it, what are, the, what are those words? Do you have this? Put me anywhere. Put me anywhere. Just put your glory in me. Wow. That's, that's, that could be my, over my forehead. Put me anywhere. Just put your glory in me. This is literally has to be the way we carry the glory of God. Not the glory of God for something or to fulfill your destiny, but just for him. He is our destiny. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You see, joy is the evidence of the Holy Spirit in us. This is why as I'm speaking, I can see the joy in your face. I can see the expression because the Holy Spirit in you is identifying with truth. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. When you're set free, like Moses, you burst into song. When you set free like Miriam, you burst into dance and song. Thank you, Lord. So, I knew I had to make this decision to, to change my lifestyle from investment banking to overseas missions. So I made a decision. I was young, radical, I only knew one gear. You start my car, I'm... It's, there's no idling. <laughs> Run with me or get out of my way. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and so I decided to, to quit my work. I had an Indian passport then. I was on a work visa. They had applied for my work visa through the, through, I got a work visa through this company. They had applied for my green card and I had just received my green card. And we were going to start applying for my citizenship, which would be quite a few more years in process. And I couldn't leave for a period of time while this was going on. Otherwise, I would lose even my status with my green card. Now, I had received the notification, but I hadn't received the actual certificate yet. And I couldn't leave the country. But I had committed to the glory of God already. So I decided, end of 1999, December, that I would leave everything and go into mission. So I literally told my, my pastors, actually, pastor, I'm so sorry, this is like not, <laughs> it's not even good counsel for young people. My pastor was advising me, don't do this the way you're going to do it. And I said, look, I, I'm not against your counsel. I know this is good counsel for me. I'm just, I just, I need to do this this way. This is all I know. I don't want to have a safe a safety net. I want to fall hard if I fall if I miss the mark. Faith has no safety nets. Faith has no plan B. So I told my I was I wasn't like rebellious or anything. I told him, look, I receive your counsel. I just feel this is what I'm committed. This is what I feel. For my own, my own journey, I was young. I was starting with old. My parents advised me, don't do this this way. Keep your job. Try to keep your job. Talk to your boss. You know, maybe you can come back. It was a six-month training school. And then we were going to go into missions with that ministry. And I told my parents, I, have, I was supporting them. They, just, they, they spent, remember I had, I, had no, I had no debt from college because they spent everything to put me through college, my brother through college, and my sister through college. They spent their entire savings. And culturally, the youngest took care of your parents when they retired. And they just retired. Huge cost for me. And I told them with tears in my eyes, I said, I'm, I have to follow the call now. I sat with my, the partners of our company, three guys, Friedman, Billings, and Ramsey. I had grown in favor 
I did not know it was favor, but I had grown in favor over the four years working for this company. If I had stayed, I could be probably working with the partners by now. That's the level of favor I have with them. I sat in their office, I told them what I'm going to do, and they said, hey, look, let's give us some time to talk a couple days, and we'll meet again. So they talked, they brought me back, and they said, look, China, we want to present something for you. You're going for six months. Go for six months. We commend, it's commendable what you're doing, charity work. They didn't know any other context for it. Do it, and come back. We'll keep your job, we'll give you a raise. We can discuss what are your terms if you would come back. What are your terms? What are the terms that can, that can be you know, desirable for you to come back to this company? They had two floors back then of, an, of a 24 story building. Now they have two buildings. And I said, I have no plans to come back. I'm leaving. I never thought I would come back to the U.S. And so they pleaded with me, when this was like several months of discussion. And in the meantime, the story goes on. I didn't ask for confirmation. I committed to, the, to what the glory of God in my life, following Him. I get a phone call. This is pre-Facebook, pre-social media. You don't know anyone, where anyone is. This is 1999. I graduated, I'm in Roslyn, Virginia in my company on the 18th floor, sitting at my desk. I get a phone call at work from 99. I get a phone call from a, my best friend growing up, Stanley, from Dubai. We grew up together, we left, and because we didn't have communication like we do now, no emails or anything, we lost contact with each other since 1992 till 1999. I have no idea where he is or any of my high school friends are, no one knows where I am. I don't know where anyone knows. I get a phone call at work. I, I pick up and say, hey, Johnny, this is Stan. I'm like, Stan? And like a two-hour phone call. I like all my responsibilities. I kind of like. <laughs> so we catch up. Just, I wasn't a believer when we were in school. He was. So I'm telling him all of my faith journey. He was so, I mean, just delighted. Just we're having the best time catching up, best friends after so many years, right? He's in Michigan doing biomedical engineering and just a phenomenal job, and they're into this like critical, like at the cusp of finding amazing, he was describing it to me, amazing uh, solutions for cancer research. And he says, look, we have a huge battle. This is a whole sidetrack here. The amount of pressure they had against this solution for cancer, it opens up a whole can of worms. And so there are many, many like us. Anyway, so he's telling me about all this. I'm telling him about my faith, and we're just rejoicing. I said, Sam, how did you find me here? I'm like, I've been trying to find you. I've been trying to research and looked up your name and all these things. It's taking me months to call you. He said, what? I mean, what, what made you think of me? I said, well, he's telling me this out of nowhere. That year, he said, I had a dream a few years, three months ago. Probably, probably matched up to when I was in Ethiopia. I had a dream. And I had to call you. And so it's been already months. And he said, in the dream, I was telling you that within three months, your feet are going to be in foreign soil. Uh -huh. And so by the time he, those months he was trying to find me, by the time we got on the phone call, it was three months until I was planning to go wow. to Ethiopia. I didn't ask for confirmation. I had already committed to the glory of God at, the, at all kinds of costs. Family level, friendship level, my pastoral level, work level, future, and my destiny, and my, my, you know, all of those things at a cost. That week, end of that week, do you guys remember Steve Hill from Brownsville Bible? Uh -huh. Well, this was in the early, he's still traveling, and he's not fully committed to Brownsville, but his name is like going around the, the you know, preaching circuit. And he's preaching at a conference or something in Virginia, and I know about, I knew about what's going on, so I decided to go. And I'm I'm not asking for confirmation. I just want to be as a God. I'm I want to I want to just be in this atmosphere of worship. And as I'm Steve Bill, I want to be here. So I sat in the back. Probably two thousand people there. He's preaching. Steve always preached on the cross, the blood of Christ, salvation. You get saved every time you're in that meeting. Yeah. Yeah. You just repent and get saved again. 
And he's preaching about the cross, his famous message. He stopped halfway through, points to the back, literally at my forehead, but not really, but in, the, in my direction. His finger is literally like this to me where I'm sitting. He says, hey, somebody here, very casual, somebody here have made, has made a decision with God. And he says this, you are not asking for confirmation, but God wants to confirm his call on your life. And he says, he says, within three months, your feet are going to be in foreign soil. Oh, so you see, when you commit to your inheritance being him, Amen. and when everything else and nothing else making sense, he will put on his garment and he will step into the arena of your life himself. He will lead you. He will lead you. And you'll carry his glory. You will carry his glory. But if you carry his glory in order to fulfill your destiny, you may miss him altogether. But if you carry his glory because of him, he will fulfill it's better for God to fulfill your destiny than us to fulfill our destiny. What I did, what I didn't know that moment when God spoke to me, I was in Ethiopia with this little kid. Somebody took a picture of that moment. You know who's holding the, big, the little kid's hand on the other side? Which one? My wife, now. <laughs> I have this moment. It was a random picture. But it's not. When your heart is God, it's all I want. Somebody asked me just last week, somebody of great respect and I honor and love and has led me so many times and ministered to me so many times. They asked me, are you sure this is what you want to do concerning what I am doing? I said, it does, that question doesn't even have a place in my life. I'm not sure of anything. I'm not sure of what I'm doing. I'm not sure of this. I'm not sure of this. My bio, somebody wrote it for me. <laughs> It's embarrassing when you, when you hear when you, when you, when I hear it. They asked me, are you sure this is what you want to do? I said, I'm not sure this is what I'm not sure. I'm here because we are following the Lord yet again. Okay. So I left 99. I left everything. Gave away everything I owned. Canceled, as, an, as a legal immigrant, canceled my green card. Went on the blacklist, canceled what they had already initiated, my citizenship, canceled it. I went on the blacklist because you're not supposed to do that. Never thought I would ever come back to the U.S. Gave up everything I owned. Everyone called me an idiot. They said, you are just emotional and young. That probably was true. There probably was a better way. I just didn't know it. The way doesn't matter. My heart is going to fall. The way to the promised land is his presence. Are you sure this is the way you want to go? I don't know. This is what I'm following. And he is sure that this is the way to go. Two years later, I married Sarah. And we decided we want to live in such a way that we have our own stories with God. And we have. We have. We can't boast of any greater accomplishment than those decisions that we made for us and our children. Amen. And we're in the season of passing that inheritance on to our children, my daughter who's now graduated high school. So, a little bit of time, I'll tell you one more story in this journey, testimony story. So we get married, 
we uh, come back to the U.S. now, a few years later, because now we're in missions, we're married, newly married, she's an American citizenship, but lived outside of the U.S. as missionaries all her life. I have lived more in the U.S. than she has, but I don't have a U.S. passport, I have an Indian passport. We're in Cyprus trying to travel. I can't even stay in Cyprus long enough because of my passport. We're trying to travel to Europe for missions. I can't Schengen visa back then, and oh, I can't even get a tedious process. We're trying to go to Ethiopia. Come on now, okay? Europe, I can understand. Ethiopia, I'm trying to go to Ethiopia. Indian passport, I get 10 days. And she gets three months. Upon arrival, I still have to apply for it and get 10 days, you know? So we're realizing, okay, our, if we're gonna be visioning for our marriage and our family, we have to have, I have to have more access. So we said, look, and her dad counseled us to go back to the U.S. for a season. It may seem like a sacrifice. Work on your citizenship and come back into missions after all of call. So we said, we'll do that. We wrote our pastor, Charles, in Life Center and said, hey, we want to come back to the U.S. for a period of time to work on my citizenship, which I had canceled and all those things, you know. And, uh, and we wanted to check with you. Is there anything that we can, we can serve at the church? Because that would be a, a great, it would be a priority to be in that atmosphere. If not, I will pursue investment banking. That's easy, I can do it in Harrisburg. We still want to be in Bethany and Harrisburg to be around the church. So he writes back and says, Chandi, it's amazing. We are actually just interviewing young couples to lead a discipleship school and we haven't felt peace about several of them that we, that we, that we interviewed. And your email comes at the right time. We just, we're, we're doing a discipleship school in Cyprus and we're leaving that coming here, and he says, would you, could you and Sarah consider leading the school? And I almost fell off my chair. Could, there couldn't have been a better thing I was, that we were engaged in at that time. So we led the Joshua School. I said last night, Lauren, raise your hand. She was a student in the school, and, and her husband, Austin, back in those days. And the theme of the school was, was Exodus 3311, Joshua remained in the tent. Come on. So I'm preaching out of something that we've lived out. We used to have hoodies. That said on in the front here, we put in a prayer room with our students and us, we put the hoodie on during prayer time, I would say, stay in the tent. Come on. Amen. And we had a prayer room called the furnace, and in the back of the, that sweatshirt, it would say, do not remove from the furnace. Oh, because it said Joshua remained in the tent, and that was a call. We did, we did this. We lived it out. You don't have to worry about your destiny. We're not trying to be a ministry school. We're not, we don't care about your gifts and signs and wonders. We are after the presence of God. And I was telling somebody last night that the way that I used to lead worship, my wife and I, we'd lead worship, and you can, you can, you can attest to this. Where's Austin? He should attest to this, because he used to play with me. I would stand up. And these are the things that are, I'm bold to do. And it's not a big church. We just are like 20, 25 students and us and the other staff. I would stand up and strum one chord until I felt the presence of God, and then we would do something else. Sometimes that one chord would be half hour. Sometimes will be an hour and a half, one chord. I'm training myself. I'm training myself to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when we found him, it was, it was glorious. Austin's here. He can attest to this. How many hours did we spend playing one chord? You don't even know used to be E. Remember playing E with me for hours on end without even going to, there was no core progression. Why would you want to progress anywhere until you feel the presence yes. of God? Hallelujah! I don't want a core progression to find him. I want to find him. And that would be a progression. I was just radical. I would think like this and I would live it out. I was foolish. So we came back, led the school, and we, I got my citizenship six years later in January and in February that year. Heartbreak for us to leave the school that we had kind of poured into over all these years, left and moved to Cyprus. Now we went to Cyprus. It's our fam Sarah's family ministry. All her siblings are there, people that we love. Worship every day, six days a week, two, three hours, prophetic intercession, all these kinds of things. Missional community, daily worship. Friday evening Shabbat, the rhythm of you know the feast and all those things, and we're traveling six months out of the year in Africa and Israel, Europe, living, and it's a Mediterranean island, the best bluest sea you could ever have. I, I went there two weeks two weeks ago for a leadership meeting. I went snorkeling. I, it is unbelievable how beautiful 
this place is. Living up on a mountain, secluded, it was, a, it was like this amazing season. Of, we felt we had landed. This is our lifelong, this is it. We've reached destiny. This is it. Our family's here. There's a beautiful community, worship, and everything we could dream of is right here. We don't have to travel for vacation. We are in vacation. Our whole life. Our kids are, are being raised in this atmosphere. It wasn't a bubble, it was our reality. Six years into that, the Lord begins to unsettle my, me and my wife's house. We begin to feel this unsettling, like there's something. There's, there's, a, there's a movement coming for us. And so we began to take staff trips to India, North India, South India, scouting trips. Inner prayer trips to see God is there. And we had established missional communities in Herrenhut, Germany, in Geneva, Switzerland, in France, in Israel, in Spokane, Washington. So we had sent our teams. And I thought God's going to take us now from this place to, like an, um, to plant a new missional community. And our context, we had done a lot of work in, in, in northern Italy. So we thought maybe northwest Italy near the Piedmont mountain, mountains or in north India near the Himalayan mountains. They're just places that we loved. And so we took teams to both those places, just scouting, prayer trip, and a mission trip, and God spoke nothing out. At the end of our third trip, two and a half, a year and a half into this discovery, God, what is it? We feel unsettled. We know there's movement. There's something coming. We feel it. You know what I mean? You just have that sense. Mm -hmm. I begin to have an encounter with the Lord. I wake up one night at 4 a.m. You know, you look on your phone and you wake up in the middle of the night. You check to see do you have enough time to sleep more that's the highest priority sometimes you wake up you need to go to the bathroom I'll be very vulnerable here not to be some cross but just real you wake up you know it's kind of early morning you kind of need to go to the bathroom but this is what I do I check to my phone if it's like still too early then I'll get up and go to the bathroom if it's like I still have an hour and I'm like oh, I can handle it just I'd rather sleep in anyone else do that or just me yeah early morning maneuvers. So I check my phone, it's 4 a.m. I didn't, thankfully, I didn't need to go to the bathroom. It's 4.00 on my phone, and I just feel this beautiful presence in the room. I don't know, at home I'm so normal, I don't talk about high and mighty spiritual things. Me and my wife and my kids, we live a, you know, just normal life. I, but I feel a presence in the room. Fall asleep, go, about, go to worship the next morning with our community, and I and, uh, didn't think of it. For the rest of the day, next night I go to bed, and I wake up again. I look at my phone, 400. Oh, my goodness, what a coincidence. And I'm like feeling the presence, a little more aware of the presence, but oh, this is so good, you know. And, and um, so I, I make nothing of it. I just enjoy that moment and just fall back asleep. Go about my day, didn't think of it. Third night, I went to, you know, went to bed not thinking about it at all. I wake up and check my phone, exactly 400. And like shock and horror, I almost did pee my pants right there. <laughs> All of a sudden, I realized that I'm having an encounter with the Lord, and I didn't even know it till, you know, it's unusual to have that accuracy at that time. That was just a sign for me. And I'm, I'm more aware of the presence, and like, God, you're, you're doing something. Am I, having, am I having an encounter? I'm having an encounter. It wasn't overwhelming, but it was very real. Gentle. I know there's a presence in the room. And I wake up now very aware that God is doing, like wanting to interact with me. He didn't say anything, speak anything, I just am very aware. I go to worship and I encourage our team. As a leader, you think, hey, it's not just for you, it's for your community. And I'm like, guys, let's just be aware God is, like, God. I didn't tell them what happened. God may want to be encountering us and those kinds of things. And nothing happens. I go back to sleep that night, wake up again 4 a.m. for 10 nights back to back. Now I'm going to sleep knowing that I'm going to wake up at 4 o'clock. I'm not setting the alarm or anything. I don't wake up at 3.30 looking at the alarm. You know, no, I go to sleep hard and I wake up exactly at 4 o'clock. He doesn't speak anything to me during those 10 days. And it stops. But two weeks later, and nothing happens in our community. Two weeks later, I begin to dream. And we've done dream interpretation and lived out of dreams for so many years. I begin to get a dream. Three days later, another dream. Three, four days later, another dream. Back to back, 10 dreams. All of them are directional dreams. All of them are calling us back to Life Center in Harrisburg. With Charles and Ann in the picture and all of those things. And I'm like, I don't want to go to America. I love America. I have nothing against art. I don't want to. Nothing. I just not, never, that was not my land, you know, that was not my, 
trajectory at all. We're here in missions. We want, if there's another community we want to pioneer, we'll do that. That's how we're posturing ourselves. All these dreams, 10 dreams I write down, when they were done, I wasn't getting any more dreams. A couple weeks after that, I showed Sarah. I told her, hey, babe, I've been giving these dreams like back to back. I told her about the encounters. And then she read the dreams. I didn't tell her what it was. She read it. She said, what do you think? I'm like, what do you think? And she said, it's really clear from the dreams. And she didn't say in light words. She said, we're moving back to Harrisburg. Come on. I said, I know. Because we've lived like that. Does that make sense? You know, it wasn't with any confirmation. God is speaking to us. We're aware of his dream language speaking to us. And we said, we're moving back. We talked to our team, our leaders at that time, and they say, hey, let's wait till October. When we go to Spokane, Washington, we have our annual leadership gathering. About 10 of us, we usually pray and prophesy over each other, that kind of thing. So wait till then so we get counsel together. Don't tell anyone till then, let's just be praying. So us and that couple know what's going on. A few months later in October, and I'll end with this, I'm traveling from Cyprus to Spokane, Washington, flying, and I'm reading through all these dreams, and more dreams came afterward. Very directional. I'm entering American land, you know, airspace. You know, you can see the flight path on the on the airplane. I'm and I'm making it grand. I'm like, okay, I'm entering American airspace. If this is true, it changes my life completely. My daughter is 12 years old. We're living in this amazing context of worship and missions and all those things. Now we're going to bring her back into. You know, the culture of America while she's becoming a teenager. It's a big deal, you know. And I'm considering all these things. God, where I'm entering American airspace. I'm going to talk to my leaders. And I said, I didn't ask for confirmation. I said, God, I know you're speaking to us. Show us how to walk it out. Show us the way to, to live this out. So my flight transit was in Houston. My pastor, Charles and Ann, were in every single one of those dreams. That's how it was directional, pointing to life center. My flight lands in Houston. I get out, and before customs, there's this long escalator. I'm on the escalator, and I, I recognize a familiar kind of back of the head. And I wait, I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm in Houston, you know? And I waited until he's gray haired. I didn't want to like startle him and that kind of thing midway on the escalator. So you wait, got to the bottom, turned around, and I said, Charles! And he looks back and said, Johnny, what are you doing here? It was literally. Get out of my dreams into my escalator. I didn't know that. And I had like chills going down my whole body. This was like a, this, it, now it became more from a dream to a sovereign orchestration. Way beyond me, way bigger than me. We ended up having lunch together, an hour and a half in transit. I'm not telling him any of these things. I'm still in shock and awe. I'm about to tell my leaders that I had 10 dreams about you and we're moving back to your church. And you are literally the first person I run into in America. Not even in Pennsylvania. It would have been kind of coincidence if it was Billy. In Houston. I've never transited in Houston in my life. He's coming back from Guatemala on a trip. Funny things in between. Detail. Details are important in how God, specific God is. I get out of the plane talking about going to the bathroom. I needed to, I need to go to the bathroom. But I'm like, oh, I'll wait till after customs. While we're having lunch, Charles would just casually say, oh, I'm glad I ran into you because my team went on and I really needed to go to the bathroom and I couldn't wait till custom. So I went to, to the bathroom and then delayed with the team and got on the escalator. Both of our, our, uh, our cycles, <laughs> our bladder cycles kind of got orchestrated every detail so that we're on the escalator at the same time. You see, when we follow the glory of God, he will fulfill every good work in you. Every good work. Every good work in you. And this is how, this is how we carry the glory of God in our lives. This is now, now we're working in life center. There's more to the story that Mark was a part of. For he used to say, I have front row seats to your faith. Do you remember that? The weeks, six weeks we were together. Maybe I'll share that story later uh, in, in tomorrow's session. But in order for us to carry the glory of God, be willing to be called a fool. Be willing for your life not to make sense. The only thing you have is God, I'm following you. It's okay if I make a mistake. It's okay if I get it wrong. It's okay if I'm leaning so hard that I lose all balance and fall flat on my face. I'm going to get up, brush off my knees, and I continue to follow that shining light in my life. 
Thank you, Lord. This is a way of faith. He, he made them walk for 40 years. Years. Until whoever could live out such a way saying, no, we want, that's not the promise. You are. That's a demand from God. Amen. That's a demand. That's not optional. That's a demand from God. Amen. It's worth the 40 years of not knowing. Yes. It's worth the 40 years of wondering. Just because you don't see it, that does not mean you are not following your destiny. It's Him. Come on, stand to it. I'll pray with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's an unction here among us. And I can see it in your own response to this call, to this rearranging of our inner working, rearranging of the constructs of our mind, our mental patterns, our emotional patterns, our spiritual patterns, that all of them would align, our spirit, soul, and body, all of it would begin to align to reposition the glory and the presence of God as your preeminent priority of life. And your greatest fulfillment is this, that you're following the Lord. That's it. This is your destiny. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart.